Hi, my name's Pat, and I'm a grateful member of Al-Anon. Um, I didn't come to Al-Anon because I thought there was anything wrong with me. I came to Al-Anon because my husband's sponsor came home with him the very first week that he was sober and said to me, are you going to Al-Anon? And I said, why should I go to Al-Anon? He's not drinking now. And he said, well, I just want to ask you a question. He said, you've been married to this man for 20 years, and you don't think there's anything wrong with you? And I didn't think that was very nice of him to say that. But I thought about it and I thought, yeah, there might be something wrong with me because I knew a lot of friends and they did not stick around for 20 years to see if it was going to work. So I went to the meetings and probably, oh, I'm supposed to look at this so I don't talk to them. Um, probably the first four months I sat there and I did not know what I was doing there and I thought, my God, these people have terrible problems and I can probably help them. And that's really... <laughs> That's really why I kept going back, but I did hear, I did hear things that I kind of knew that I should know and I didn't know. So all my life I had known that um, if he didn't drink, we wouldn't have problems. And I'm telling you, he didn't drink and we had terrible problems and we didn't know what to do about them. And I kept going to Al-Anon and little by little, you know, um, I can't really tell you what happened um, in 15 minutes because we've been married for 43 years. 20 years while he was drinking and 23 years in recovery. And I can tell you the 23 years in recovery is a lot better than the 20 years drinking. Although somebody asked me the other day, was all the drinking bad? And you know what, it wasn't. There was a lot of fun times. There were a lot of fun times. And there were a lot of bad times. But anyway, um, we had a lot of problems and we didn't have any answers for those problems. And where I found the answers for those were in Al-Anon. Um, it seemed to me like he got better real fast. He stopped drinking and everybody started calling and saying what a nice guy he was and I'm thinking you gotta, you're not talking about this person that I'm living with. But anyway, it was, it was very scary for me. The first year of his drinking was the worst year of my life. It was worse than all of the times that he drank because I've lived with alcoholics all my life. I know exactly what to do when they drink. I don't know what to do when they don't drink. And it was a very scary time for me, and I remember feeling a lot of pain. I mean, that, that knot they talk about in your stomach, because he was looking better, and I wasn't looking so good anymore. So um, I, you know, I knew I had to do something, and I knew my only answer was to go to Al-Anon. And um, I'm just going to hit on the high spots of what Al-Anon really helped me do in the, very, in the very beginning that helped our relationship more than anything. And the first thing was that we would have these horrible arguments about, I'm right, and you're wrong. And uh, nobody wins in those arguments. <laughs> Somebody always leaves feeling really bad. And I, I wanted to be right, and he wanted to be right. And it was a problem. So I talked to my sponsor about this, and she said, you know, when I hear you talk about it, you're saying, well, he's right about this, and, and I'm wrong, but I think I'm right about this, and he's wrong about that. And she said, you know what? It is possible for both people to be right and have different opinions. And that was news to me. And I went home and told him, and it was news to him too. And, um, and I have a good analogy for that now, and that was, she said, it's like holding up a dollar bill, and I'm looking at it from this side, and I'm telling you what I see, and you're looking at it from that side, and you're telling me what you see, and they aren't the same. We're both looking at the same dollar bill, but we're not seeing the same thing, and that was our problem. We did not see the same thing, and we were both, neither one of us were wrong, but the way we had been raised was, you had to be right. If you weren't right, there was something wrong with you. And I didn't want anything to be wrong with me. But um, that, that helped our relationship a lot because then when we would get into those heated arguments, we could say, you know, that's your point of view. That's just your point of view. And it wasn't so hard to let go of it because my point of view was different. So that was, that was one of the things that helped us at the very beginning. But I was raised to be a people pleaser, and my dad was in business, and his idea was, you know, you have to please the customer, and they're always right. So I didn't know that was people pleasing when I was growing up, but I found out it was. And you know what? There was a lot of validation from that, and people gave you a lot of, you know, what a nice person. And then eventually when you don't know what's wrong and you don't feel very good, it's hard to figure out because you're doing good things, but you're not feeling very good because you never do what you want to do. You're always doing what other people want you to do. And I was really raised on social expectations, so it was really hard. And Howard was a very strong person, and he always knew what he wanted to do, and we did it. And, uh, 
I didn't know why I didn't feel good, you know. And he would come home sometimes, and I would be standing there crying, and he'd say, what's the matter with you? And I'd say, I don't know. And he said, well, I don't understand it. You know, uh, you wanted a car, I bought you a car, you don't have to work. And he would name all the reasons I should feel good. And I said, I know, I just decided, well, you know, I just must be an ungrateful bitch, because I feel terrible. <laughs> and I never knew why I felt terrible, but it was because every time he wanted to do something, I never said, you know, I don't want to do that. And if I did say, I don't want to do that, he would give me all the reasons why I should want to do that. I never had any reasons for not doing it. So I would do it, and I would cave in. But this is what happened. He came home one day, and he said, um, well, you know, this weekend we're going to go to Fresno, and you're really going to have a good time. We're going to go up there. We'll go up there early, and we'll have dinner, and you're going to have a good time. And I said to him, you know what? I don't want to go. And he said to me, no, it's, you're going to have a great time. You're going to have a great time. And so I didn't say anything, but I did go and talk to my sponsor. And she sat down with me, and she helped me work out what I was going to say. But the main thing she helped me work out was that I wasn't going to be angry when I said it. Because every time I told him I wasn't going to do something, I had to get real angry to tell him. And that's where I got my strength was from the anger. And then I could say what I wanted to do. I never did it. I never got to do what I wanted to do. But anyway, I got angry and I told him what I wanted to do. And so she, the, the main thing she pointed out to me was that I had to not be angry when I told him. Because his attitude was, when I was angry and I told him what I wanted to do, it was like, well, she's mad, and when she gets over that, you know, she doesn't really mean it. So, anyway, she helped me work out what I was going to tell him, and he came home and said, you know, this is the weekend we're going to Fresno. And I said, um, you know, Howard, we've talked it over, and, and I don't threaten to leave anymore, and, and we're going to be together, but um, if it causes you pain for me not to go, I love you enough that I'll help you through the pain, but I'm not going to Fresno. And I wasn't angry. And he like went nuts, because I had never ever been able to stand up to him and tell him that I wasn't going to do something without being angry. He says he didn't go nuts. <laughs> but I think, you know, he was like so surprised, because he knew that I really meant it. And for the first time, I knew that I really meant it, you know, that I really wasn't going to go, and it didn't make any difference. How many reasons? My sponsor told me I didn't have to have a reason for not doing anything. If I didn't want to do it, I didn't have to do it, and I didn't have to have a reason for it. Boy, was that a wonderful thing to find out. Because he always had reasons, great reasons. And then I would cave into that and felt terrible about myself all the time. So that was a wonderful thing that happened. Anyway, I didn't go to Fresno, and he got somebody else to go, and it was wonderful. And then little by little, I learned, you know, I learned how to ask for what I wanted. I always wondered how people got all these things that they wanted. How do people figure that out? When I was growing up, you just, people were supposed to guess what you wanted. You know, if they really loved you, they knew what you wanted. <laughs> well, I didn't get anything I wanted, and everybody else is getting all this stuff. And I'm thinking, how do they get that? You know, and, and they told me, and Eleanor, and you have to ask. That's part of getting well. You have to ask for what you want. <laughs> Well, that was a new concept, you know? Ask for what you want? That's great. But anyway, so I learned how to do that. And it was a wonderful freeing experience. I have learned, you know, I've learned how to have a relationship in Al-Anon. And even though I don't do it perfect, I'm much better than I was before. And when I go see my family who are still, none of them recovered and have gone to a meeting, I can really see the progress. You know, they're still waiting for everybody to guess what they want. You know, it's just not going to happen. It's just not going to happen. And um, I would say that um, we really owe everything in our relationship, as far as our relationship, to Al-Anon. And uh, we've talked about this before. And Howard's very active in AA. And, you know, and I'm really glad for AA that it keeps him sober. I have some other things that, you know, that I'm not happy about in AA, but that's okay. I like the sobriety part. In fact, we were just talking about this before, and I said, Goldina and I were talking about it before, and I said, you know, I really love AA, and I'm really glad that he stays sober. But when they say, don't say no to an AA request, he would never be home. He would never be home. And we had to find some balance in our life. We really had to find some balance, because I had a big resentment against AA. Because I, I wanted him not to drink, but I also wanted him to be home and be part of, our, of my life. And uh, we've worked that out. It's taken a while, and you know, it's like when we first come to the program, we want everything to get better right away, and you know what? It doesn't. It doesn't. 
but it will never get better if we don't keep going. The program really is a process. And I think even if we just go to the meetings and we just hear what we hear and we don't even know we hear it, it's kind of like a Chinese water test, that torture test where they just drop a little drop of water on your forehead and you don't even know that something's getting in there. And then when something happens, you have a solution because we've heard about those solutions in the meeting about what other people did when that happened to them. And then we can use that solution if it works for us. And that's a wonderful thing. And that's how I found out about myself also was coming to Al-Anon. You see, I came here perfect. They didn't have anything wrong with me because I didn't drink. Sounds so righteous and that's right where I was. Um, and I found out there were a whole lot of things wrong with me. A whole lot of things wrong with me. They weren't all him. There was a lot of things wrong with me. And I was really grateful, but I'll just tell you one thing and then I'll quit because everybody gets their 15 minutes. Um, when we first started the program, he said to me, um, you know what your problem is? You're going to Al-Anon and you don't even know what your problem is. You don't even know what you're working on. And you know what? That's really the truth. I really envied the alcoholics because, you know, I was kind of like a wannabe alcoholic. They knew what their problem was. They knew exactly what they were working on when they went in there. And I didn't. I just went in, sat in the meetings, and knew there was something wrong and that it just wasn't quite right. And I think we have a harder time figuring out what's wrong with us. And because I, th I think I had this little magnet in my head, and I'm totally attracted to alcoholics. I mean, you could not keep me away. It's like, uh, you know, my parents tried to talk me out of marrying. Howard and I met in seventh grade. We didn't get married in the seventh grade, but we met in the seventh grade. <laughs> and, and so we've known each other all our lives. And, you know, my dad did not want me to marry him because he drank too much. My dad drank too, and he was an alcoholic. But Howard drank too much. And you couldn't have kept me from marrying him. It was like that magnet, you know, I was going to marry him. You could not have stopped me. So I don't know what it is, but there is this attraction. And it's strong. We talked about it the other day in the al meeting. I mean, you know, the normal people have such boring lives. And this is just, this was everything I wanted to be. But you know what? It, I'm in a better place now than I would have ever been. That nice little normal boy I know that went to college is still boring and his life is still boring. And I think I have a really exciting life. And thank you all for letting me share, and it's wonderful to be here.